Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having me in this digital history seminar. I want to talk to you about my research group, Helsinki Computational History, and uh, I want to talk to you about how we use high-performance computing to study the Scottish Enlightenment. Now, let me get immediately back to the, uh, or or directly to the to the promises. So, there is an ongoing promise because of the change in NLP, natural language processing, that has happened very recently, within the last three or five years, because of these large language models, BERT and others, uh, that also studying 18th century intellectual history will change. So the argument is really that uh, currently, or before the way that people have been using methods, machine learning in intellectual history, uh, has been very surface word-based approaches. So word to vec, uh, different kinds of topic modeling, looking at collocations, and then talking about conceptual change. Most of this has been about word change, not really about ideas and how meanings are changing. So if we want to make things very, very simple, one, two, three, uh, we can say that what we will do in the near future is extracting all the relevant passages for, for a particular idea from 100 million pages of text or more, and then we will model the evolution of an idea across time and across languages as well. So the language is just one boundary among others. And then what we will do is to do what the historian wants to do, which is study liberty, slavery, human rights in the Enlightenment era. So the real change really would be from words to meanings. And this is something that I and my associates, my uh, colleagues, think that will change drastically in the near future. So one thing when we talk about high performance computing is that it's very much available, but also underused in social sciences and humanities. So in Northern Europe, I'm talking from Finnish context, of course, uh, we have cloud computing, supercomputers available. Uh, our group, for example, have access to basically whatever we need. Uh, we can do very large uh, runs of different kinds of uh, ways of molding the material that we are studying. We can use uh, unsupervised learning in, in ways that was not possible before. The thing in history is that because this is difficult and we have a culture of people just working alone, uh, integrated interdisciplinarity isn't really happening and also then the use of this kind of resources uh, is underdeveloped. It's We can compare, there's of course the comparisons to bioinformatics that in 15, 20 years ago was more or less in the same state as historical research. Uh, that has taken great steps forward based on machine learning. Uh, the same thing if we look a bit closer to home, uh, corpus linguistics, of course, has been able to do uh, use methods in a, in a more broader sense. But I think this is also changing the younger generations of historians that are, are, are taking these kind of questions very seriously and, and the world is changing in, in that way as well. But the way that we see it, uh, the objective of every historian is that the better understanding of the past only comes by looking at larger contexts. So if we want to model history as we should, if I'm interested about Finnish intellectual history in early modern times, I can't uh, limit myself to the Finnish borders, current borders, but we need, I need to look at it from the perspective of Sweden. If I want to understand the perspective of early modern Sweden, I need to look at it in a European context and so forth. So in reality, uh, whatever we are studying, we need to take these larger data sets and, and start working through them. And at the same time, the integration of HPC into our processes is more than obvious. So for today, the structure of my talk is that I, I, what I started already doing, contextualizing this data-driven research in intellectual history uh, and talking about possibilities, 
this will lead me now to talk about our strategy. I need to talk a little bit about it because I think it can uh, work as an example also maybe for others. I will talk about our work with structured data. So all the time throughout the, my talk, I will be talking about this interplay between structured and unstructured data. Uh, I will then turn to the cases where we use HPC to create new data from unstructured data. So transformer models for studying genres. And then I will also talk about text reuse detection uh, for the study of reception. And then uh, at the end, I will get back to the future and cross-lingual semantic similarity and, and what that will mean uh, for the future of intellectual history. So I've been consistently building a Helsinki Computational History Group now for a decade. So from a smaller parts to larger. And uh, maybe a difference in quite a normal way of approaching this kind of research in humanities is that the idea here is not that it is a project, even if a large one, but it's a group that works through different projects. Obviously, we need funding like everybody else. And if we are not successful in, in, in different kinds of a, uh, funding schemes, uh, the work of the group doesn't continue. But there is uh, different elements, sort of continuity, people who are on a more permanent basis, and then also building people's uh, careers so that uh, doctoral students advance to postdoc and postdocs, we try to get jobs elsewhere, which we've also been successful. Uh, so that there isn't a real argument that that it's a it's a group that we are running, and it's not a department uh, of collection of people, but but actual group. So another central thing is that it's again I use always this term integrated interdisciplinarity. So we have computer scientists, data scientists who approach it from their perspective. Uh, then we have people from linguistic background who are looking at words and concepts in a different way than maybe historians. And then we have uh, people with the history background and also people who are sort of uh, mediating. Of course, everybody in our group does computing or, or programming at some level, but <clears throat> it's also important not that everybody is doing exactly the same kind of things. So the division of labor is also crucial for us. What we also needs to be understood that it's a group where the main interest is intellectual history. So the answer, what is good enough data, it depends on the research questions. We are doing a lot of work that is book history, but book history exactly like a book historian would maybe understand is not what we do. So in our recent paper, we've been developing this idea of cultural mechanics where there is a more of a leaning towards understanding of the Scottish Enlightenment as an intellectual phenomena, for example, that is different from people who study the same publishers, say, but from with the re interest of looking just them as actors. We also use this uh, concept of bibliographic data science. So me and my early uh, collaborator, Leo Lahti, we developed that where there's an idea of this kind of a open science ecosystem, how, how things develop uh, together. Uh, so, so data is always in use. There's always iterative developments ongoing. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, aspects of management in that kind of sense. And we also work on different cases uh, and different scales of cases, but mainly on early modern printed materials and, and also then what, what has become clear is that once we have been moving towards the use of HPC, collaboration even beyond our research group is desperately needed. Uh, we, for example, started one where we are working with Turku NLB group uh, that are one of the best groups in Europe uh, to work with noisy data sets. So, so that uh, collaboration is very important for us. Uh, and, and through this, uh, there, there will be scalable and, and, and points of collaboration uh, that are coming up all the time. So, so this kind of a uh, involvement is, is really, really important for us. So one way of understanding uh, what we do is to look at this 
graph where we want to understand the public communication in early modern Europe, movement of ideas and conceptual change. And what has become more and more important for us lately is the tool development and research data releases. So, for example, graphic user interfaces was something that, let's say, five years ago, I thought that we are definitely not developing them. But uh, because of the collaborations that we have and having people around who are really good at front end uh, development and, and making digital humanities accessible to people with the intellectual history background has become more and more important. So I will now today de demonstrate also a couple of different user interface tools uh, that we have been developing. And just to mention funded projects, uh, so we have one on high performance computing and historical discourse detection uh, and, and also then a couple others, Academy of Finland ongoing projects that are important for us and, and through which collaborations have uh, started and, and gone forward. So just as one example of historical discourse detection, not to bore you uh, too much with the strat strategies and so forth. So make things again fairly simple. So what, what we've done is that we've developed a way where uh, clustering and, and filtering of different large data sets work so that we can show uh, the algorithm one particular work uh, and, and ask that this is what I'm interested in. Uh, please divide the, the data set based on similar content. Uh, and this actually works. Uh, so a good example what the BERT model uh, trained on historical data and maybe looking at it from a vocabulary based perspective can do for clustering. So we published that as an article uh, called Distinguishing Discourses, a data driven analysis of works and publishing networks of the Scottish Enlightenment this year. So just to uh, make the point already here that, that we are uh, doing what we preach. Computational history is pretty simple, straightforward business. First, you spend time uh, organizing, uh, creating data, understanding it. Then you spend time subsetting, filtering, uh, maybe combining in some cases, and then you spend time analyzing it. There's nothing very mystical about it. A lot of people uh, talk about that they have such a special uh, ways of, of making the analysis or, or, or doing doing using algorithms and, and techniques. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if that's that's the case really in the end. Uh, and, and a lot of people they often say when, when I explain that we use metadata for, for many things they're all oh, that's so boring that we, we just want to analyze the large data sets and, and the unstructured data and do things with that. To me, it doesn't really make sense that because the, what you really want to do with the unstructured data is to approach it systematically. And what is it that you do with the metadata? Well, you use that uh, as a systematic way of, of understanding the phenomena that is behind. Uh, so, so really, I mean, it is this interplay between them that matters. So ideas that, that metadata could be ignored, I, I just don't, don't understand that. Now, I've been using this particular slide or versions of it uh, many times when I explain that what we want to do. So it is really the processing of large data sets that is unstructured data that then leads you in one way, always creating the metadata or the structured data that is the systematic source for, for your interpretations anyway. So the understanding of the large data sets that what happens when you use those is to create different ways of, of getting a systematic approach that can, uh, in many cases, be seen as something that supplements the exact uh, existing structured metadata. So a lot of the time, uh, this is really what we do, uh, play with between these two, two different elements. Uh, and, the, and the good part, thing about the metadata is that even if we don't have all the possible images in a museum or, or objects uh, available for different kinds of studies, 
we often have metadata available, uh, regardless whether it's uh, uh, perfect or not. It never is. Metadata is never perfect. But it's often such that we can actually use it. So if we think about cultural heritage, uh, we should be thinking way beyond texts. Even when we are working with texts, when we're working with ideas and so forth, the material that we have is not uh, digital born, born textual data. It's the very rich uh, objects that we are studying, even if it includes text and the ideas are expressed there that we are mainly interested in. So this idea of materiality and materi material objects is, is really what, what should interest us. And they're the key, the metadata is, is very much a key for, for us to get uh, behind the phenomena that, that we want to study. So often people also tell us or, or, or me that, well, you are just working with text data. That's not true at all. We are working all the time with image data when we are uh, doing what we are doing. But we are also creating metadata out of the, of the large data sets that we have available. And this, of course, uh, has, plays a big role behind our choices that we make along the way. So for the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, the, here's a, one kind of a graph for the ecosystem that we have. What is at the center is this English short title catalog ESTC which is about for metadata for about 500,000 different documents, uh, ranging from 1450 to 1800. So hand press error in the British context is what we study. And then we have a lot of different, uh, it's not for nothing that we have chosen to work on this, because we have available the 18th century collections online, which is a so-called dirty OCR of 240,000 documents. But not only that, uh, it also includes the images. Uh, we are using those all the time. It includes the, the offset information, so how they, things are laid on the page, uh, very important for us. We also use early English books online, which is a, a more of a clean hand keyed data, uh, but not so interesting as 18th century collections online because of the lack of that material uh, information. And then we have a lot of different uh, other uh, supplementing sources, especially bibliodata sources, publisher information uh, and so forth that we connect to the ESTC uh, and, and it's a kind of like an ecosystem that is all the time uh, developing. We've done different operations over the years and we are doing all the time different new new things and, and one thing that we are now currently doing, we've had the different British Library newspaper collections, uh, but we haven't really used them because our ESTC and ECHO collection hasn't been yet in the shape uh, that we would like to connect it with the, with the newspapers. But now this is something that is actively happening. Uh, so one step at a time, uh, we are now prog processing with our steps. So with ESTC, uh, just the metadata collection uh, and very important steps for before getting to use the unstructured data or, or unstructured data outside the metadata collection is that we used the different um, fields, uh, especially the imprint field, to extract information about printers, publishers and booksellers. Uh, so that was unstructured and we have turned into structured data so that we can actually look at the book publishing also not only from the perspective of authors but also from the publisher perspective. And also another thing that we did uh, based on sort of a different fields and unstructured data is that we algorithmically linked the edition uh, work field information across the ESTC data. And that for us in whatever we are doing is a, is a crucial thing. Uh, also for, for text mining and, and other processes that we have, because if you can't uh, know that which editions are part of the same work, you could call it Ferber model or whatever uh, from the bibliographic uh, perspective. But if you can't do that, it's really, really difficult to know that you are systematically uh, doing anything. But because of these and some other steps, we are now in the process where the ECHO and EBO uh, can be used to enriching uh, the ESTC uh, further. Here are a list of different kinds of, uh, just to emphasize that how much have we done just with respect to the metadata of the ESTC. So we've been modeling book price information. Uh, we've been also combining ESTC to other collections, studying 
Latin and vernacular in Northern Europe. We've been looking at the French influence of British publishing by taking the metadata from the French uh, national bibliography. Uh, and we've also looked at the representativeness of ECHO and EBO based on the ESTC. We've been studying cultural dynamics of the Scottish Enlightenment and so forth and so forth. Now, uh, I want to mention particularly this one article, uh, if any of you is working with the British Chaucers. So, Anatomy of 18th Century Collections Online. This was published in 18th Century Studies uh, a bit more than a month ago. Uh, and and so that's openly available. But, but for example, if you want to use that echo source for data mining, it's very important to know, for example, what is represented here is that the coverage of the pamphlets uh, in the echo data drops drastically after the 1770s. Um, and for example, if you are uh, someone whose research interest is pamphlets in North America, uh, ECHO is not the correct source for you because there are so big gaps in the data. So that kind of information is available uh, through that article. We spend a lot of time on it. Now, just to say, tell you a little bit about what we did with the publisher information that uh, in my perspective is, is really, really important for the intellectual history and Scottish Enlightenment, for example, that a lot of people study, uh, myself included, study David Hume, um, William Robertson, other people like that to understand the, the Scottish Enlightenment. But what we also should be studying are the, the publishing uh, networks behind uh, the phenomena, the intellectual phenomena, and, and also through that, thinking about the role of the publishers. So we've created a particular data model where the works and the authors are linked. And that way we are able to to take the perspective of who was the actual publisher for, for each work. Now, one thing to understand is that this doesn't create uh, the sort of a using the imprint information doesn't give us 100% accurate uh, information about each publisher uh, as such but it's the beginning of the work. So every time we are creating a, a new um, case study, we also need to work on, on the, the data and refining it further. So for example, what, what we end up is the two tables, one with book trade actors, and then the links between the objects. And this can then be used as a, as a starting point, like you see there, uh, there are, uh, name variant uh, and name unified if it's J pots that is not 100% uh, accurate but the question is when are we needing accurate information about the publishers and then uh, we work uh, more closely with that kind of cases if we don't have supporting databases that would give us the correct information so for example for the Scottish Enlightenment case when we were working on this cultural mechanics of the Scottish Enlightenment we went further to uh, refine some of the information and we were able to make these uh, different counts of key Scottish works and, and also looking at the highest ranked publishers uh, who were publishing them and then use this information to ask particular questions. So just to mention in this one work that we just recently uh, finished, it's not yet published, but it's called Cultural Mechanics of the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, we started from the fact that uh, the relationship or the dynamics between Edinburgh and, and London publishing in the 18th century is really key to understand one part of the Scottish Enlightenment. And for example, uh, David Hume, who starts publishing uh, his history of England in Edinburgh, uh, ends up like many others in, 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 in London and being published by Andrew Miller, who was a Scottish born publisher himself but then the question was that that how many other uh, authors or works follow the same path and we started working uh, on this question and starting to use the imprint information to look at the relationship between and um, changes in edinburgh and london publishing and we were able to reach conclusions that we thought uh, had not uh, been answered in book history earlier and, and really f revealing like a different systematic patterns of the interaction that change across the century between Edinburgh 
and London Publishing. I want to talk to you now how we use HPC to create structured data out of different big data sources. Now, one very uh, important case for us and uh, important question has been genre. So most of the genre data that we get directly from metadata is of very, very poor quality. Also, it's understandable that uh, different ways of uh, classifying different works are done for many different purposes. So not many people are looking at the 18th century books uh, based on the on the classifications that maybe 18th century publishers uh, were using. So this is, has been our aim to have systematic data about this. And another thing that we've been thinking about is that when you are using or creating genres, uh, why do you think that each book would be of one genre only, or that you make this kind of a bucket uh, that one work is of 10 different genres that doesn't really add anything to your systematic approach? Why can't you say that uh, these chapters in a book are, are of religion and these chapters are of history and these of philosophy and so forth? So we've been started training different models based on embeddings that we get from Ecobert uh, to explore genre changes within books so that we can really break down a book into multiple different genres. There's a paper uh, that is published next month in the Computational Humanities Research Conference Proceedings, uh, if you want to read it, but it's not yet quite out. So one reason why we wanted to do this was really to look at the genre distribution in documents in ECHO overall. Uh, and what how we approached this was that we started by doing hand annotation, me and Jan Ryan, who's my postdoc, uh, we did through an 18th century Scottish Enlightenment publisher, Andrew Miller, and the networks related to him, we went through all of the works uh, and independently classified each work based on a, on a scheme that we created ourselves, and then iterated further from there, uh, coming up with a pretty good uh, classification of these documents uh, that we then used uh, as a training data to go further. But what we did was that we, instead of uh, doing it only per document, we broke each doc book and document into chunks of 512 tokens and then used Ecobert sequencing with um, gener generated uh, predictions for each segment. And then what we wanted to do is to then use that data to look at sequential uh, genre changes within the book. So uh, it gives us a very good way of, of actually doing uh, what we set out to do uh, and, and looking at uh, larger changes that can happen at the, at the chapter level or essay level if it's a collection of essays. Uh, and we used, for example, this burst detection uh, model to see exceptional changes within, within genres in a work. And this worked uh, amazingly well. Uh, so, for example, if I take David Hume's political discourses, that is fairly easy to analyze based on the different genres, because, for example, there are essays that are of economy uh, and some that are clearly philosophical, some that are uh, to do some, something with religion and, and so forth, uh, and with respect to scientific improvement. And this really... Uh, gave us uh, superbly good information. And this is also something, I mean, there are also others, uh, like Underwood has been doing this uh, sp specifically for 19th century data, uh, so it's not unique completely, uh, but but the results for ECHO uh, are very, very promising. So, so this is something that we can then uh, we create, obviously, structured data out of this uh, in a way supplement the metadata that we have and can use for for different kinds of uh, cases that that we are developing for example here if i made a comparison that now when i have this genre information i can take works that are according to our scheme 
classified as 10% philosophy combined with 10% religion and, and start looking at these documents on the timeline. And here what you see is the beginning of the document and the end of the document and, and which genres are, are present in those, those parts. And here you can see towards the end of the work there's a, a combination of history and, and literature whereas philosophy and religion are uh, sort of dominating the beginning of the book. So these are pretty good descriptions of what is actually happening in the work. And most importantly, then uh, we can combine this with any other uh, sort of a distant reading task that we have ongoing. So for us, this last summer when we were working on this sequential genre change uh, work, really was an eye-opener for us uh, about the possibilities that we can do for creating new structured data out of unstructured. I want to emphasize I'm really, really excited about the possibility to study materiality with respect to ideas. Also, this creating new data from layout information and full texts. And uh, for that we've been creating another data set coming out of the 18th century collections online using text reuse. So text reuse detection uh, is effectual way of, of studying reception in particular, but, but also because reception uh, relates to everything, how ideas are changing. So, so it's a really a one structured data set that can be used to study any change in ideas. So things, very basic things, if we want to start with who quoted Shakespeare, why is that happening? And, and many people have obviously dreamt of chasing down uh, sort of borrowing of particular works or particular author. But then if you think about it, that we can do that instead of just looking at one author, we can look at the whole 18th century that is really something else, something where computational methods uh, are, are really uh, doing the job that we hope them to do. So what we've done is that we used BLAST bioanalysis software. That is, I mean, obviously we are not the only ones who have been looking at text reuse. This, there's been a, for the past decade or maybe even more, there's been different groups using different uh, algorithms for doing that. But for example, Passim that is quite uh, widely used uh, when dealing with noisy data it it just can't handle what what blast is able to do so we ran thanks to the HPC uh, resources available we ran the whole echo with respect to uh, textual overlaps uh, more than 200,000 texts uh, looking at one from 150 uh, characters up for the reuse fragments coming up with a data set of uh, half a billion pairs uh, uh, to use for for then further analysis and also what is important when thinking about the text reuse that this is far from being a task that is trivial like you see here there's two fragments that are the same uh, from two different works and already here there's highlighted the differences that are caused by the dirty or noisy OCR uh, but but there are even worse cases where for human eye it's almost impossible to see the difference between the, the fragments uh, or, or the similarity between the fragments but uh, somehow the, the BLAST software is able to actually recognize the differences. Like I said at the very beginning uh, of my talk, that we've been lately developing different tools uh, that are easy for anyone to use. Uh, so I want to demonstrate the text reuse data based on our reception reader, uh, which is in a prototype phase. Uh, this is not public quite yet. But uh, so we are able to, this uses the whole data set of half a billion uh, pairs of, of text reuse pairs. Uh, so I can make a first search based on metadata. So what do I want to look? So let's put Hume and political um, discourses and search for that. Uh, here we get a list of possible matches. I want to look at the early, early 
volume so let's pick one from here uh, as you see there's quite a lot of reuses here in the chart uh, so what we have here is the very beginning of the book uh, up here page zero uh, or page 15 in that case where there's the first reuse case uh, coming all the way to the 300 pages so what you see here uh, these all of these uh, circles are reuse cases on a timeline so after its publication in 1752 when that edition was published there are all the cases uh, dropping uh, Hume's own works but all the textual overlaps are here uh, available so now I can uh, pick uh, whatever I would like to see what we see here uh, the vertical lines are usually the same book uh, so here we have an early correspondence uh, was ongoing between Robert Wallace uh, and David Hume about dissertation on the numbers of mankind which is Wallace's book uh, and so they were having a ongoing debate very much uh, and that's what the political discourses also relates so now I can pick that and just click on it um, and what opens up here on the on the right side is the actual reuse case on yellow so on highlight and Hume, the ori originating source, political discourses and Wallace's where he's quoting Hume. So a very, very effective tool where I can pick any possible work included in ECHO and see all of its uh, reuses uh, in general. To do this uh, is a pretty difficult operation because it has so much data points so if, if you don't know what you're actually doing it would crash every time and what we are now currently doing is adding different features to this uh, interface so that you can uh, use it in different ways so currently like okay let's try a later uh, Thomas Mortimer's uh, elements of commerce and see what comes out of that uh, so here we see uh, these two different uh, again the the original text of public credit uh, essay by Hume and where Mortimer is then quoting it now for a historian this is useful because you can then uh, explore in this way and start also reading the actual text around for context uh, quite useful useful thing also if you just like to look at the instead of a chart you can look at the table so this is now organized by pages uh, where the text reuse is happening and I just click here uh, Lindley Morris English grammar and again uh, it opens uh, here Hume is quoted uh, here so a lot of different ways of looking at uh, attributed or non-attributed text reuses uh, that are happening in Hume now in principle text reuse is a pretty simple thing so we are talking about textual overlaps but when we start thinking what we can actually do with the recognized systematically recognized textual overlaps there's quite a lot of uh, possibilities so one thing that we need to understand is that there are different types of text reuse we've got full reprints uh, and partial reprints we've got quotes uh, and we've got modified reuses and we also have uh, plenty of attributed and unattributed uh, reuses so one case that we can do uh, when looking at full works or editions is that we can start studying how uh, editions are developing um, and we can do this in a scalable manner so not only developing one case but developing several uh, based on the same method so what we have here is a chart about the flow and development of Bernard Mandeville's works very important for the Scottish Enlightenment so his poem uh, Grumbling Hive develops into Fable of the Bees other works are included as well uh, they go during the 18th century uh, there's many different developments and all of this can be done in a data driven way not so that we start uh, drawing this kind of a map ourselves but just use the text reuse data and see how the flow of Mandeville, Mandeville's own works develops over time also what we can do is start to uh, calculate coverages and, and how much 
material uh, from certain authors is coming to the works of a particular author. So again, looking at Bernard Mandeville, uh, in scholarship we know that Pierre Bale was an important source for Mandeville. He was uh, accused of being plagiarizing uh, Bale. Uh, but here we can see all the other works that are important. Jean Leclerc, uh, for example, Plutarch, Horace, uh, and so forth, who he is using quite a bit in his works. Uh, they can be scaled and, and a number of or pages of overlap can be actually calculated and, and then by systematic comparisons we can say something about Mandeville's interaction with other authors. And also of course we can start understanding Mandeville, uh, how other people are reusing his works. And now when we think that we also have that uh, genre information for example available so we can actually identify the reuse genre for each uh, borrowed passage, uh, if you use your imagination in historical research, there's quite a bit that can be done just based on the very basically simple uh, overlaps of texts. All right, let's take the next step. Now, what were we doing in the text reuse case? We were detecting textual overlaps. We were clustering them uh, after that and then making our analysis based on those clusters of text reuse. Now, what if our analysis was not only based on the actual text being reused, but that the meaning of the passage is the sa same, regardless of the question of language or how it's expressed? So we are not tied anymore to the question of word use, but we are looking at meanings in context. Now, the best way for me to demonstrate that what we are doing with semantic similarity detection is to show you a demo of a cr cross-lingual semantic search interface that we have made based on similarity in meaning. So what we are using here is 18th century collections online texts uh, that I've used in all of my examples and we have a VV8 vector search engine uh, and a multilingual sentence transformer model uh, that we can use in many different languages. Um, so we're not going to use check, uh, we're going to use finish. Uh, so, so let's uh, try here. So let's try women are equal to men. And let's see what it brings us. Um, it gives us good good hits. Uh, women and men are, are thus equal to each other from the Weekly Entertainer. It gives us hits on Locke and two treatises of government. Uh, and it even gives us Rousseau's text that is not in English, but in French. Uh, so this is just to show you that this actually works and what is important, not the language so much, but the fact that you don't have to use exact phrases. We are not looking for any kind of a fuzzy search hits on the words. We are actually looking at meanings. So what I want to communicate is that what I was showing you with respect to text reuse is very much the same what we will be able to do when we are chasing the development and evolution of ideas across the century. So first extracting relevant passages for an idea from the 100 million pages of text, then starting to model the evolution of an idea across time and languages being cross-lingual is very important for us and that enables us to study liberty, slavery, human rights in the Enlightenment era in a new way. So in the way, nothing uh, technically impossible, but at the same time, very, very important for us intellectual historians who want to understand multiple meanings of an idea and intention and reception uh, in ways that wasn't previously possible. Okay, it's been nice talking to you, but 
it's also now time to conclude. So maybe the main takeaway that I'd like to leave you with is this idea that I started with and I've been emphasizing throughout my talk that we need to think about the interplay of structured and unstructured data when we go along. And what we need to do is to create this type of a virtue cycle of better data. And we need to also understand that it's a never ending process. The data, it will never be perfect uh, for research in a way that we would maybe uh, fantasize about. And it never will be like that. Uh, so it needs to be good enough, something that actually can be used. And then when you ask the question, how do I know the data is good enough? Well, it's only when it's good enough for the research questions. So it depends all on what you are actually asking. And then if we ask that, why are the historians not all of them using or working also in a data driven way where you take uh, advantage of high performance computing and uh, machine learning and so forth? I think the answer is that there are two changes that are needed. One is scientific. We need to be able to move from the anecdotal way uh, to systematic. That is anyway what historians want to do. Uh, but the change from the smaller to larger data sets uh, and combining these hasn't been really easy. And also there's, there's a lot of cultural uh, reasons. So in the humanities, for some reason, we still live in this time of lone heroes uh, instead of groups, private uh, instead of open. And still another thing that I wanted to say is that, that the machine learning, as we can witness within the couple of years, is, is really developing quickly. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of digital humanities, digital historians, computational this and that, people who are able to do things on their own. But maybe the answer is that don't do everything alone. Uh, and they're the, the kind of a very natural move from individual researchers to research groups is something that can be fostered and uh, encouraged. Uh, but that's really all that I had to say today. Uh, looking forward to discussing specifics with you. Thank you.